Okay, Jean, go ahead. Thank you. Welcome to our fourth webinar, Oral Health in Rural Communities. I think you will find this a very interesting presentation, and uh, we're very glad to welcome our uh, new faculty presenter, Dr. James Cosart, to this afternoon's presentation. I have several announcements before we start. Um, one is that I am, have sent all of you copies of the most recent Environmental Protection Agency manual on pesticides and am um, hoping that you have all received them by now. This is a key reference work for dealing with pesticides, so we wanted to make sure that you each had your own copy. As most of you know, the scheduled on-site training during the week of October has been moved until the last week of April. We are partnering with the National AgriSafe Network to provide some good bridge programming between now and April for those of you who have already registered for the full course. Um, by bridge programming, um, I think that this is a new term that I have recently made up, but it includes the fact that uh, AgriSafe will be setting us up to use their constant contact system, which will allow us to keep in touch with you during the next five months, uh, sending you additional readings, notices about special AgriSafe webinars available to you, and so on. Also, course textbook, the new revised version of the course textbook um, is due to uh, arrive from the publisher in February and will be mailed out to course participants then. Uh, in April, um, the opening day of the training that you all attended on September 11th will be repeated the day before the rescheduled training block begins. So if you just signed up for the webinars and would now like to attend the full training, this will still be possible. Otherwise, if you know colleagues that would be interested in the complete course, registration information will be available starting next month. So, um, I wanted um, to say something about the course quizzes. As you will know, they are all posted after the webinar ends. Uh, participants need to plan to pass the quiz for each webinar in order to continue through the course. Um, they are set up to give you three tries. So for instance, if you take the quiz once and get a score of five out of a possible ten, do be sure to take it again. Um, five is roughly equivalent to a score of 50, and it's not really a passing score. Uh, the last thing I'd like to mention to you is that Dr. Julie Smith, our first webinar presenter, has sent in some additional information about uh, rabies, which has been posted on the course website under the initial webinar. It is my distinct privilege to introduce to you Dr. Jim Cozart. Uh, Dr. Cozart was a farmer in northern Kansas for 20 years. In 1999, at the age of 42, he received his DDS degree from the University of Nebraska College of Dentistry. Uh, after graduation, he practiced for eight years in Middlebury. In 2007, Dr. Kozark and his wife Deb moved back to his family's sixth generation homestead in Kansas. There, during a seven year period of upgrading their 384 acre farm into a grass fed cattle ranch, Jim and Deb established two separate rural dental practices. Both practices were sold to younger dentists and they continued to serve the two communities at present. In July of 2014, Dr. Jim and Deb 
returned to Vermont and established a new dental practice in Bristol, Bristol Park Dental. Within, with an open schedule and accepting all new patients, they opened their doors October 1st of last year. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jim, and um, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me out there? Okay. Everybody okay? Somebody. Yes. Sounds okay. fine, Jim. Thank you. All right. Okay. Well, thanks for the great introduction. Uh, my name is Dr. Jim Cassart, and I'm here to talk to you about dental issues in rural Vermont. Uh, this this presentation will be short on facts and figures and large on anecdotes and pictures. And um, I, I feel it's important that health care professionals that are not dentists have an understanding about what's going on today in Vermont's oral health. So this is a picture of Bristol from up on the Bristol ledges. The view from the ledges is the reward you get for taking a vigorous hike up on a trail just on the edge of town. And the town of Bristol has been very welcoming to us. They've been very good to us. We really like living here. A year and a half ago, my wife and I were living on a ranch in Kansas, as she said, and uh, we took a vacation to our beloved Vermont. And after eating a great meal at the Bobcat Cafe, we took a walk around town and we discovered a vacant building right on the town green that years ago was the dental office of Dr. Kim Montgomery. We'd been wanting to return to Vermont, so we bought the building. Uh, we did a fair amount of remodeling, and we, we equipped our dental practice uh, to start out. And we opened the thing on October 1st, 2014, with zero patients and a completely open schedule. To give you a little background, I have spent most of my life on a farm in north central Kansas. That's me. I think I'm about 15 years old there. Uh, I got my de agricultural degree from Kansas State University, and after college I was a wheat farmer and raised beef cattle for about 20 years. Now farming out in the Great Plains in the 80s was very hard work for very little money. Uh, I enjoyed it, but I always wanted something more, and my local dentist inspired me to pursue my dream of becoming a dentist. And in 1995, I became what I call the oldest living dental student at the University of Nebraska College of Dentistry. So in 1999, and at age 42, I became a practicing dentist, and I moved to Middlebury, Vermont. Now there's a picture of our <laughs> of our sign anywhere on, on Court Street. Um, there's a very strong Nebraska-Vermont dental history. Vermont has no dental college, and most of the students of the dental schools in the eastern United States are urbanites, and they're reluctant to start their dental careers in rural settings like Vermont. Nebraska, on the other hand, has two dental schools and a higher percentage of students that were raised in rural areas. There are a surprisingly high number of Vermont dentists that were either raised or educated or both uh, in Nebraska. And we had a great little office in Middlebury for eight years, great staff, uh, really enjoyed it. And But after our kids left the house and went off on their own, Deb and I sold the Middlebury practice to Dr. Brian Saltzman, and he continues to do a good job. And we moved back to my sixth generation family farm in north central Kansas. And over a six year period we remodeled the farmhouse and rejuvenated my old place into a 384 acre grass fed organic beef ranch. And uh, there's some of our critters out there we call them. While we lived on the ranch, we developed two separate dental practices across the state line into southern Nebraska. Now each of these offices were they were very rural, which is to say each of the two towns had no more than 1,500 people apiece. 
And these are typical of Great Plains states. When we say rural, we really mean a very sparse population. And there's uh, that was our other practice in Hebron, Nebraska, and that was the proud new owner of the dental practice that she bought from us. While we were in the state, in Nebraska, we worked with both the university and the State Dental Association, and we found two young dentists uh, to associate and then buy each of our little dental offices. And these offices continue to do well, and they're uh, serving the communities well. And every single staff member of both offices uh, remained. So let's get to talking about teeth here now. And I always say without good oral health, a person is never truly healthy. You know, we have set up a health care system in this nation that seems to separate teeth and the rest of the body into two different disciplines. And that's always puzzled me because obviously teeth are body parts. The mouth is a portal of entry for nearly everything that enters the body. What goes on in the oral cavity affects everything else. If the ecosystem of the mouth is compromised, the body has to deal with infections and inflammation, and these challenges can drag the whole body down with it. Among other things, uh, it's been well proven now with studies that the amount of inflammation in the teeth and the gums is directly correlated with the amount of inflammation in the, uh, uh, the arteries in the and cardiovascular health is certainly impacted. So dental problems are medical problems. So the medical community and the dental community need to work together on these things. Now the number one dental problem in Vermont that we see rurally is just plain old tooth decay. Now tooth decay is not that complicated. The primary culprit, among other bacterial strains, but the primary culprit is an anaerobic bacteria called Streptococcus mutans. And by the way, that's a, that's a quiz question there. Streptococcus mutans. All humans have this in their mouth to some degree. Now, plaque, that white, cheesy looking stuff seen on the teeth, when you don't brush, <laughs> is nothing but billions of bacteria piled on top of each other. Uh, they secrete acidic waste products, and they consume dentin and enamel. So the way we tell our, our little ones when they come in here, to put it in simpler terms, this bacteria we're talking about, the only purpose in its miserable little existence is to poop on your teeth and to eat your teeth. Now the main fuel for strep mutans is glucose. Now many people get the idea that if they eat a Kit Kat or they drink a Coke and then they rush to the bathroom and brush that sugar off their teeth, they're home free. That's not how it works. A sugar coated tooth is prone to decay certainly, but when sugar is consumed, the blood glucose levels spike and this provides everything the bacteria needs to undergo a population explosion in the mouth. So decay literally starts from the inside of the tooth. You know, in societies that have no sugar or refined carbohydrates in their diet, they do not have decay. I, I've seen this uh, in real life. I've seen Middlebury College students from third world countries that come into the office and they've never had a single cavity in their life until they moved here and started eating our high sugar American diet. And in the United States, we have a lot of sugar in our food, as we all know. And in Vermont, we have an extraordinary amount of tooth decay. Now, tooth decay is preventable to a great extent. You know, obviously, we need to devote resources to the early education of children and especially the parents about diet and hygiene. We also need to provide fluoride supplementation, especially to young kids. And nutrition plays a major role in oral health, and I'll expand on that in just a little bit. When I talk about generational attitudes, quite often I'll hear young adults tell me, well, my dad lost all his teeth by age 30, so I will too. 
and you know you look at this guy and you think you know as if this preventable disease process that is tooth decay is some sort of predetermined genetic fate. Another thing I hear is I have soft teeth and no, no one outside of very few that have some genetic disorder, nobody has soft teeth. Teeth don't decay because they're soft. They get soft because they have decay. Now let's expand a little bit on nutrition here. Geologically speaking, Vermont is an extension of Appalachia. The geologists tell me that the Green Mountains used to be higher than the Himalayas and this is some of the oldest earth on earth. Now that's a lot of erosion and our Vermont rocks, our soil, our water have very low levels of calcium, fluoride and a, a host of other micronutrients that are essential for healthy tooth development and maintenance. And when you talk about income levels, it's now common knowledge that the lower the income level, the more likely the diet will be high in sugar. With sweetened beverages like soda and so-called sports drinks, it's not uncommon anymore to see people walking around, you know, particularly young people walking around with a bottle of Mountain Dew in their hand often all day long and the sugar in the soda is not the only culprit. If you read the ingredients of any soda, and this certainly includes diet soda, you will see that it probably contains somewhere on the label phosphoric acid and that's what gives the soda its bite, the taste. Phosphoric acid actually dissolves tooth enamel and that brings me to a little story about an experience I had in dental school back in Nebraska. We put an extracted human tooth in a beaker of Mountain Dew to see what would happen and uh, Christmas break came and it went and my lab group forgot about the experiment and by the time we came back from our generous four weeks of vacation in school, we looked in the beaker and the tooth was gone and all that was left in the bottom of the beaker was a cloudy precipitate. It had completely dissolved that tooth. And here we have a little more mentioning about nutrition that I said before. One thing that we notice in our practice is this 20 to 35 year old population. They generally have the worst teeth of any other uh, slice of people in our data. And most of that fact is due to these five factors that I mentioned before. So. Let's take a look at a young man that calls up our office because we are one of the few practices that will accept new adult Medicaid patients. So looking at this fellow, if you're an employer, um, you know, would you hire this person? Now looking at this guy, I can see without even getting out my dental mirror or even taking any x-rays that he has at least eight teeth that are hopelessly infected and for the sake of his health they need to be extracted and as I said he has Medicaid insurance. Now most rural people do have Medicaid insurance. If you have Medicaid insurance in Vermont you get $510 per year. Medicaid will pay to clean, they'll pay to examine, they'll pay to, for fillings and they'll pay for extractions. They will not pay to replace anything. Now the Medicaid coverage in Vermont in 2013 there's 161,000 enrollees and with the expansion of the Affordable Care Act this has increased to 184,000 by this year or an increase of 23,000 patients. I think this is great. Obviously the ACA is providing more people with coverage and that's what it was intended to do. So in Vermont we have some figures here. I told you I'd be low on figures. I'll try to hold it down. But 80% uh, of the Vermont dis dentists accept Medicaid. But the problem is Medicaid fees are so low 
that they pay me as a dentist about 60% of my normal fees or the fee that a private insurance company will pay. Most practices limit their Medicaid patient population to about 10%. And most practices are full and will not accept any new adult Medicaid patients. And why should they? They lose money on each patient. So the rest of the self-payers and those with private insurance plans end up subsidizing the Medicaid portion of your population. This is what they call the cost shift. Now, it's not all gloom and doom and bad stuff with the uh, with, with Medicaid program. There are good people that run it. Um, they're very prompt and responsive. Um, but the best features of Vermont Medicaid is the fact that they do not have a limit. That $510 li dollar limit does not apply for children to age 21 pregnant women or nursing mothers. This is a great thing and it allows me as a dentist to provide all the proper care that these people need at such critical stages of life. Now let's go back to our uh, young man again. And after the medical side of his insurance is paid for a fair amount of money on his emergency room vi uh, visit and that's where we get quite a few of our patients, uh, they have a raging toothache, they don't know where else to go, so they land in the emergency room and then they get referred to us. So he comes into our office and he's got $510 in annual benefits. And I'll certainly take out the tooth that is causing his immediate problem, but if he's got one bad tooth, odds are he's got several more. And I know it's a matter of time before he'll be faced with yet another big problem. So we've got to get ahead of this infected process. So first he needs a good exam, which we've noted in orange here on the pie chart, because we need to find out exactly what and where the troubles are. We need x-rays, which is in yellow, because what lies beneath in these bones sometimes surprises us. We, have, we just have to know what the roots of these teeth entail. Then because perhaps he hasn't been to the dentist in many years and his teeth are hurting so bad that he avoids brushing them, we have to scrape off the calculus buildup, which is called a debridement, and that's shown in the red slice. And then shortly thereafter, we have him return for a second visit for a proper cleaning. And all this is to get his elevated bacteria levels down, and we can start either extracting or filling without causing a reinfection and further jeopardize his health. So once we got him through all that, now we can safely treat him. So what we're left with is $256. Now that assumes I have not taken any teeth out. So this $256 will provide anywhere from one to three extractions or one to two fillings but not both. That's it for the year. That's all he gets. Now, Vermont dentists are a compassionate bunch and I've heard of many instances and had many myself where the patient comes in and has five, six, seven, eight teeth that are abscessed and after the doc takes out the two that he'll be paid for, he or she just keeps extracting for the sake of the patient's health and the doc doesn't get paid for it. Our patient mix here at Bristol Park Dental, most of our patients are rural. 20% have private insurance plans and 30% uh, are either uninsured or their self-pay, of course. So that makes our practice mix about 50% Medicaid. Now that brings up, uh, sorry, for the pun, uh, nose shows. Now a particular problem that we've had when we have such a large Medicaid population is no shows. Over the last year we had 81 no shows. Now that's over two per day. If a patient calls and schedules an appointment, we call them the day before and confirm that they're coming in. If they don't show up, we cannot bill Medicaid and we don't get anything for it. So 
For example, if this is a cleaning appointment with our hygienist and the patient doesn't show, we have to pay her 32 bucks an hour to vacuum the carpet. So in this past year, we've had over 80 no-shows, three-fourths of them were Medicaid, and our carpet is really, really clean. So, whoops, sorry about that. So let's look at our, our past year. We had 626 patients that we actually treated in my chair. Out of that number, I extracted 267 teeth. Now that's about six teeth per week. To give you a comparison, while we were in very rural Nebraska, I probably had one extraction per week. Now I am a general dentist. I excel at crowns and bridges. I do fillings. I make dentures. I know how to extract teeth, but I was never trained to be an oral surgeon. And just as an aside, Medicaid will pay me $98 a tooth uh, for an extraction, no matter how difficult they are. Uh, another aside here, a phrase that I hear quite often, especially from young men, is, ah, uh, doc, just pull them all out. Uh, let me tell you, there are very few things more difficult than removing a tooth out of solid bone in a living, breathing, and conscious human being. It's hard work. Sometimes I think I get a new gray hair every, every tooth I take out, but with the lack of accessible oral surgeons in Vermont, this is what's required of me with my patient base. Another problem I run into is that some of these multiple rooted molars are so difficult to remove that it's beyond my comfort level or even my capabilities as a general dentist. Many problematic teeth must be removed by an oral surgeon and we have a grand total of one oral surgeon in Addison County, and he is swamped. The oral surgeons in Burlington are facing a similar situation too. I never dreamt that by moving from rural Kansas and Nebraska to rural Vermont that I would become the uh, de facto oral surgeon of Addison County, but when a patient comes in and has an abscessed tooth, that is causing excruciating pain and harboring a raging infection that's an inch from his brain, that tooth needs to come out. So with all my complaining here, you, you might ask, well, how do we stay in business? Uh, between the building purchase and the equipment, and we really did it uh, on the cheap here, I think, but. Uh, we bought some used equipment. Uh, we keep all current technology, but so it took about a little over half a million to start this dental business. Currently, we're trying to find some financial help to make this thing work. Uh, and by the way, because I was a farmer and because I didn't start this gig until I was 42, my student loans will be paid off when I'm 76. Um, as of now, we get by because we don't spend much money. We have one car, we live in an apartment, and our, thank goodness our kids are gainfully employed. But obviously, we can't keep this up very long. We love what we do, and after 17 years of providing care for rural dental patients, we're pretty good at it. We choose to live in Bristol. We have great friends here. It's a wonderful state to live in, and this is where we see our future unfold. So we will, we will make it work. Now, meanwhile, back at the ranch here, um, most cattle ranchers have a border collie or a blue healer to herd their cattle. Well, we used a poodle. Uh, that's Grady, and he is now our official patient greeter in our little office in Bristol. And he's a popular guy. He, he seems to cut the tension, and people like him, so uh, he has fun, too. So let's get down to some practical stuff here. When the reason most people land in the emergency room with a toothache, it's caused by an infection uh, that had its roots in untreated gross tooth decay. And this is what I suggest to do for these patients. Um, if they have noticeable swelling in their face, 
prescribe them augmentin, 875, BID, twice a day for seven days. And if they don't have swelling, then just go to good old amoxicillin 500, three times a day, seven days. And if they have a pen allergy, just go with the clindamycin 150 milligrams uh, or 300, depending on the severity of the infection, for seven days. And then they need to see a dentist. Quite often, a lot of these folks, after the antibiotics kick in, the pain goes away the next day, and they, for some reason, they think the problem is solved. But we have to stress to them that this does not fix the underlying problem. Let's talk a little bit about pain management. First, let me say that these ER docs and PAs, they have a brutally tough job to do. Uh, I don't envy them. When someone comes in screaming in pain with a horrible toothache, the, the doc just wants to get them out of pain as soon as possible. And they're probably sitting there thinking, you know, I didn't go to med school to be a dentist. But we are seeing a lot, a lot of tooth infections in the ER now. So let me share the benefits of the research I have read, as well as 19 years of clinical experience. Good old ibuprofen at high doses, and we're talking about 800 to 1,000 milligrams, is just about as effective at pain control as any of the opiates, such as oxycodone or hydrocodone. I tell my patients that have abscesses that while they may have one more bad night, the antibiotics will generally reduce the pain to a tolerable level in about 24 to 36 hours. Then we need to try to get that tooth out of there. Oh, and that's a, also a quiz, a quiz question of uh, ibuprofen as the preferred first line um, treatment. And you know, with the huge opiate addiction numbers that we have in Vermont here, I think prescribing these things for toothaches, it's just adding to the problem. And almost all the time, they're nearly always unnecessary. In, in regards to if you get a cranky wisdom tooth, often the problem is not the tooth, but the infected gum that's grown over the erupting molar. And in my experience, antibiotics and some just some simple excision of the overgrown gingiva there next to the tooth will often provide very quick relief, almost uh, within a few hours. And then, of course, the wisdom teeth need to be removed by an oral surgeon. So before we leave this unpleasant subject, let's take a look at the economics of this problem tooth that this guy came in, say it's a molar, and he doesn't want to lose it. Uh, if a large amount of the tooth structure is gone already, it's, it's probably a hopeless case and it needs to come out. But if it can be repaired, this is the economics of it. Now, with $510 of uh, Medicaid benefits, that doesn't go very far because the root canal is going to cost about a grand. The buildup to uh, replace the lost dentin is going to take 250 then a crown, 950 So you got 2200 bucks in this tooth. So obviously, you can see the wisdom of treating a cavity while it's still small and can be done for 100 bucks or so. Uh, also, a little, uh, little information. There's been a lot of confusion over the years about who needs pre-medication prior to dental work. The American Dental Association, in partnership with the American Heart Association, tells me this. Patients with prosthetic joints do not need routine antibiotic prophylaxis. Heart valve replacements also do not need routine antibiotics. As the literature tells me, it makes much more sense to focus on improving the oral hygiene of any given patient and get them cleaned up rather than just throwing antibiotics at them. Now we'll talk a little bit about pediatric dental care. This is one of our little calves. He was one of our favorites. Uh, I've been focusing mainly on acute adult infections here, but before we quit, Let's talk very briefly about some kids. Get these kids into the dentist early. I can't emphasize this enough. Most dentists will accept Dr. Dinosaur, uh, the dental program, because they have no limit uh, to the coverage. And it will benefit that dentist to see that child. 
get them in every six months to select clockwork and get them that proper fluoride supplementation that they need. Brush and floss, brush and floss, we can't stress that enough and don't rely on the child to do it. The parents got to get in there and get them clean. And avoid the soda for gosh sakes, especially with developing children, avoid the sugary drinks and whatever you do, don't let them go to sleep with a bottle in their mouth. Well, that's about all. I, uh, I'm sorry, I, these are the basics of care with, with kids. Uh, that's also another quiz question. Um, first appointment should be the appearance of the first tooth or within the first year. Get them back every six months. Get them some fluoride drops and um, make sure they don't drink a lot of sugar. Now my last slide here, that's my favorite picture in the whole world. Uh, I tell everybody that my wife Deb runs the practice and that I just show up. She does a great job with our patients. She works with our employees and she is the business manager. We've, we have a lot of fun doing this, this dentistry thing and uh, we hope we can continue to serve the needs of Addison County dental patients for many years to come. And that's all I have. Hello, Gene. Are you there? Thank you, Jim. You're welcome. Yes, yes I am. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, Thank you for listening. Jim, I hope that um, you can take some questions now. And also, I would be interested in you uh, um, mentioning the three readings that you posted for us today. <laughs> I'm very embarrassed to say I, I've forgotten where they where I put them. <laughs> ah, well, one was the crisis in rural <coughs> dentistry, okay. which you've certainly been touching yeah. on. The other was the management of patients with prosthetic there joints. You go. And then a longer article about the prevention of ineffective endocarditis guidelines from the American Heart Association. Thank you for uh, jogging my memory there. <laughs> yeah, I'd be, I'd be glad uh, to take any questions you have or comments. Jim, do you take VA health care? We do. Um, okay. They, uh, that also gets to be a, a bit of a uh, administrative headache, but uh, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll sure take care of our vets. Okay. I actually live down on Maple Street. Uh, you worked on my wife, Kathy, the other day, um, but I've been, I need actually to come visit and get a check-in. Oh, so you send the wife in for um, as a guinea pig and then you, you come in later. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> um. Jim, you have some questions on the chat box, if you can see that okay. on the side of your screen. Okay. Uh, da, da, da. Do you worry about giving too much fluoride to kids, especially young boys? Between fluoride and the water, the toothpaste, mouthwash, the studies have shown to be de detrimental in young developing boys at a high level. Um, this is a real controversial subject with some people. and any research that I have seen, I don't think there's any problem with the amount of fluoride that we're talking about. First of all, we drink very little, even if the, the water system is fluoridated, we don't drink much water anymore. We mostly drink bottled water and other stuff. Uh, there is very, very little in toothpaste. Um, I think you have to have extraordinarily high levels of fluoride to do any sort of damage and that damage is generally just the staining of the teeth. But there's something else about fluoride. Some people have a problem with the type of fluoride that they put in uh, water systems and I think that bears some, some study because I'm not sure what their source is. But I know that pharmaceutical grade fluoride is good 
good stuff. It's clean stuff. It's not going to hurt anybody. And so many people don't understand that fluoride is an essential micronutrient for, for development. We have to have it, like iron, magnesium, uh, any of the trace minerals. And I think you know, I'll have patients come in and they say, well, I don't want any fluoride, and then they got a whole bunch of decay, and I'll tell you, there's nothing more miserable than trying to uh, fix a bunch of decay on a six-year-old, and I would just assume they take some fluoride early in their life uh, to prevent that. Jim, you, you have uh, at least one more question. Oh, there oh yeah. Talk. Do you see any changes in Vermont with the future for increasing uh, reimbursement for dental care with Medicaid clients? Well, uh, we've got to. It's it's just it's just crazy the level that they're trying to pay these dentists, and then uh, you know it's no wonder they don't want to take any Medicaid patients because. Literally, when you figure out my costs of running this pr this place, when I put a an adult Medicaid patient in my chair, I am actually paying him to sit in that chair and work on him. And this has got to change. They have to increase the reimbursement level, or they're just not going to. You know, you can cover all the people in the world, but you have to pay the doctors to do the work. Otherwise, they won't do it. They um, and this is a problem we're running into with so many. Uh, so many of our uh, patients being Medicaid. I, I hope they're going to increase it. Uh, politically, that'd probably be pretty tough. Uh, I'm not holding my breath, but uh, they've really, you know, uh, if if you're going to insure people, then insure them. Don't just say that you're insuring them and then just not have anybody accept the insurance. Um, how much of this is diet related? Um, there's a lot. Diet has a huge effect. You know, uh, patients that come in and they don't eat much sugar and they don't eat much refined food, boy, they don't have much decay. And if they do have decay, it progresses very, very slowly. But if you have somebody that's drinking a bunch of Mountain Dew every day or any other soda and uh, and a lot of sugar in their diet, the, the decay just becomes extremely aggressive and they literally make holes faster than you can fill them. Um, how much fluoride do I recommend? I leave that up to the pharmacists. Um, they, you know, they know the drugs um, and it just depends on the body weight of the child. You start out with drops and then when they get a little older you can uh, give them those cool little pills to chew up, which I tell them are basically vitamins for the teeth. And we do see uh, quite a bit of uh, bottle mouth decay. And by the time the parent brings the child in and they've got, you know, all their front teeth completely rotted out, um, then generally I can't touch them uh, and I won't put them through the experience. We They generally have to be hospitalized and put under and have all that that work done while they're sedated, which gets extremely expensive, uh, you know, and you can see where prevention is much, much cheaper. Um, I got another patient or another question here. Have you found any particular dental problems or trends among farmers uh, as a distinct rural subpopulation? Well, it's hard to tell because, you know, Vermont is so, uh, we paint it with a broad stroke that it is rural. Uh, it's not like uh, some of the um, metropolitan areas, but I think the biggest thing is uh, nutrition. Once again, um, farmers it used to be two generations ago, uh, farmers were the healthiest bunch out there. Now, uh, farmers by and large are, are <laughs> they're fairly sedentary, and their their diets are getting poor. Um, Dental problems are distinct among rural people only in uh, direct correlation with the income level, I believe. And uh, that's all the questions I, I see on my little box here. Um, anybody else have any questions well, or I, comments? I think you know. 
So, Dr. Jim, yeah. I'm, um, you have uh, posed a real dilemma yeah. um, in your presentation, which is that Sorry, to, have, sorry to bring everybody um, down. <laughs> <laughs> but you've talked about uh, the fact that it's simply not over time fiscally possible for someone in your position um, willing to serve a large number of Medicaid patients right. to make ends meet. Yeah. And um, that um, so the uh, that lead seems would seem to leave you with the choice of serving less fewer Medicaid patients and more better paying patients in order to uh, keep in business. Yeah, it's it's uh, boiled down to that. We we when we started this, we told ourselves we'd give it a year and and see what developed, and now now we see what's developed, and so we have to adjust somehow. Um, like I said, we're we're pretty simple people. We don't need a whole lot of income to live, but we do need enough, and we need to stay in business and pay our employees. So, yeah, we we hope to attract more um, uh, patients with a little better insurance, if you'll pardon the way I said it, and uh, get a little more efficient at what we're doing, and hopefully uh, get a little help from the state or the or the feds. Um, to make this worthwhile, uh, keeping our doors open. Uh, um, I'm seeing, a, seeing Turner, another. Uh, yeah. Right, you have two more questions there. Uh -huh. uh, is there any research or evidence that co-locating dental services in PC offices um, results in better access to care? Uh, I, I'm sorry. What, what's a what's a PC office? Primary care. Oh, oh, okay. Um, it'd be nice if you could have it in the same area uh, as the physicians, but the trouble, the thing that makes dentistry so unique is the tremendous amount of equipment and overhead that you have to have. Like I'm listening here, I'm in my office and I'm listening to the compressor and the uh, vacuum downstairs and you know the whole building is plumbed with all sorts of stuff and it takes a lot of money to set up the infrastructure of a dental practice and then you've got all of our x-rays are digital and so it takes its own particular software so I, I think it'd be a little tough to uh, for the the docs to be able to contribute a whole lot to that they could do some preventative stuff but Generally, you know, you want to look at the teeth pretty hard and see what's going on. Um, yeah, I, I see a comment. Somebody's physician is saying the same thing, and and he <laughs> he complains a lot about it, it, about the reimbursement thing. Well, that's nice to know. I'm not the only one. But um, th there's a question in regards to opiate. Um, I feel that opiates given for dental pain, I think they're part of the addiction problem. I probably have, you know, out of 600 and some patients in here, I, I can think of about 8 to 10 either active or recovering addicts in my patient base, and half of them have told me that they got started on pain meds from a toothache from going to the ER or, or their, their doc. And, uh, it, the the opiates, like I, I want to stress this as much as I can, the opiates, they really don't work that well. And I don't understand why they continue to prescribe these things. Uh, you know, they're better off just hand them a bottle of ibuprofen and tell them to take a lot of that. So, but that's, that's my opinion anyway. Uh, anything else? <laughs> yeah, patients aren't satisfied with that. Uh, yeah, that's for sure. Um, and they probably look at the ER doc saying, well, you're not a dentist. You don't know what you're talking about. But um, yeah, I don't know if we can go to tramadol for pain, if that would help. But but quite often, I'll have a patient laying in my chair, and he hands me a whole bottle of IB or, uh, hydrocodone. And I'm thinking, why, why does he have this? Uh, 
Yeah, exactly. I came to the ER for our ibuprofen, but basically the value is the um, the antibiotics. And you, like I tell my patients, look, you're going to have one more lousy night, but after these clindamycin or amoxicillin kick in, um, you'll have a you'll have a better day uh, two days from now. So just hang out. Um, and yeah. I, I've tried tramadol on a few people, and um, I've had some people say, "Well, that really didn't work very well." But uh, good old ibuprofen is just about as good as you can do, I think. Maybe you can substitute a little Tylenol in there too now and then, but Tylenol generally by itself doesn't do very good with tooth pain. <laughs> Neither does hydrocodone. <laughs> um, the question is, do you and your staff have time and resources to do preventative education? Uh, our hygienists certainly do. They are so good at that. Um, you know, you come in here, and I always tell my patients when they're laying back and they got their mouth wide open, I say, well, uh, you know, you have to get a lecture when you're in the dental chair. So while uh, you can't talk, I'm going to talk to you. So I really try to to give them the big picture about sugar and diet and hygiene and all that good stuff about taking care of themselves. And the hygienists, that's what they're all about. And uh, we have three part-time hygienists here, and they're all very good at that. Um, do do I see any probability of dentists joining together in Vermont to lobby for better Medicaid rates? Um, the Vermont State Dental Association is really quite active and quite good, but they just don't seem to have the political power uh, to make those rates go up. And I don't know what the I don't know what the solution is, um, and I didn't mean to be all gloom and doom here. I just wanted people to know what we're dealing with out here. If so, people have questions later on, um, can can they email you? They certainly can. Um, do you have my email there? Why don't you tell us what it is? <laughs> okay, it's D R J I M V T, which stands for Dr. Jim Vermont, at Bristol Park Dental dot com. Thank you. You bet. Ah, and Kathy's helping us out here. Yeah. Uh, somebody made a statement, it's important as providers to understand why folks don't take care of their teeth due to the coverage. That is so true. You know, people come in here and I'm not judging them. You know, they, they got problems and I, I try to do the best they can without, you know, um, looking down on them because life is hard and uh, not everybody makes a high income and not everybody's eligible for good insurance. So. Uh, the rest of the population needs to rely on Medicaid, and I think the Medicaid needs to up its game, certainly. Dr. Jim, I, if John Turner is still on, on the webinar, I'd like to ask him if he knows if veterans um, have uh, good dental coverage or if they have any dental coverage included in their Medical I, I'd like to know that because I've got a couple of vets here. Um, I have one. Um, <clears throat> yeah, go ahead, please. That that's something that's kind of been a little bit tricky because, um, I, like, um, like going down to White River is really where the only dental um, facility is. Yeah. And for me up here, that's kind of a pain in the butt. And I know I need dental work done. Um, and so they've had. Uh, I think last year and then maybe like three years ago they wrote referrals, but it's kind of like the same thing I think with most of the Medicaid um, patients where you have a certain amount of money that can be used and it's, it's it, I mean I understand entirely like you know any, any, any physician or dentist who does not want to deal with the VA because it, it is a nightmare, yeah. um, but it's, I, I, I don't know, it's not it hasn't been very helpful 
And like most of the times I think that we just want to stay away from the VA because honestly the work that they do is not, it's not very good. Yeah, I've, I've got a Vietnam vet in my practice and he, I don't understand, he doesn't get hardly any coverage at all and he has to go down, you know, he has to drive down there and, and he's not in good shape. And they don't provide yeah. him with, with very little coverage. Uh, it, it's not much better than Medicaid. And um, I, I don't understand that. We need to take care of our vets. Yeah, and another thing is like, I mean, because I have, um, when, when I have a dentist near my mouth, I mean, I have a piece of shrapnel on my face. Mm -hmm. And I have like a lot of anxiety around that. Yeah. And um, in order to actually have a cavity get filled in, um, they gave me like, uh, no, two shots of Novocaine plus the whatever is stronger than Novocaine and it still didn't do anything for me to like help me be at ease. So it's like to get a cavity filled, I actually have to go try to find some place to get knocked out because I can't deal with that. And you know, I know there's people who have post-traumatic stress greater than me in a dentist chair, um, but it's just I think that's also one of the things where maybe you might find worse dental problems uh, within veterans yeah, and I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I, so think, I think that's that's we see that a lot, and and a lot of people will come in. And they'll say, "Well, I need to get knocked out," and I <laughs> I'm not an oral surgeon. I don't have the license to do that. And um, like I said, there's one oral surgeon in Addison County. So you know, what are we going to do? Who is that? I'm just but I'm curious. That's uh, Scott Bowen, uh, Doctor okay. Bowen, right? Right on. Actually, that isn't true. His father works there too, uh, on a limited basis. So there's actually two, but it's it's just one practice, and they do fabulous okay. work. But you know, they're expensive. Yeah. Gene, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but I would say it's a major pain in the butt to deal with the VA um, when it comes <laughs> time to doing stuff um, outside of their practice. But that's certainly an answer. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I, so, Jim, I think that uh, participants are expressing their appreciation for okay, your work. Okay, well, thank you. That's, that's nice to know. And um, so, we can, you can, um, think we can all try to think of, of um, well to do dental patients that we might send <laughs> their way. <laughs> well, we, we love them all, but we'd kind of like to make a living too. In barring any further questions, um, I think that um, we'll be ending early today. Okay. Um, but before we do that, let me remind folks that um, there is a considerable amount of reading for the next week's webinar on vector-borne diseases. So I encourage you to uh, not leave it to the last moment. And please take uh, the quiz for today's presentation. Um, Dr. Jim has been uh, helpful about uh, pointing out uh, when he's giving you answers to some of the quiz questions. An added bonus. <laughs> so, Kathy, I think you can stop the recording. <laughs>